Jesus, I will ponder now on your holy passion. With your spirit, me endow for such meditation. Grant that I, in love and faith, may the image cherish of your suffering, pain, and death, that I may not perish. God bless you as you ponder the passion of our Lord. Let us begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
help is in the name of the Lord. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and of one another. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you in our thoughts, in our weeds, and in our deeds, and in all that we have not done. Forgive us in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Deliver and restore us that we may rest in peace. By the mercy of God, we are redeemed by Jesus Christ, and in him we are forgiven. Let us rest in his peace until the rising of the sun, when we shall serve him in newness of life. Tonight's reading comes from John chapter 15. You always know this is a good portion of scripture when all of it is outlined in red in some of the older Bibles, and Jesus just goes through everything. This is where I am the true vine comes from. This is where his one command comes from. So we read from John chapter 15. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is, my, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay one's life down for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I have learned from the Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is what the, why the world hates you. Remember what I told you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obey my teaching, they will also obey yours. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father as well. If I had not done among them, the works no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. As it is, they have seen, and yet they have hated both me and my Father. But this is to fulfill what is written in the law, they hated me without reason. When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning."
We meditate upon another section from John's Gospel, John chapter 18. Just five verses. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. I have spoken openly to the world, Jesus replied. I always taught in synagogues or at the temple where all the Jews come together. I said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. When Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby slapped him in the face. Is this the way you answer the high priest? He demanded. If I said something wrong, Jesus replied, testify as to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? And there is no good answer to that question of the passion. Why did you strike me? When that thug of a high priestly official just slapped Jesus in the face for no reason and then was asked why he did it, he gave no answer because there is no good answer. What could he say, really? Jesus of Nazareth, on this cold night, you spoke the truth into my cold heart, and I acted violently, and so I hit you. Jesus of Nazareth, whether it is right or not, we in this room need to control you. And when you said that, when you answered the high priest's question with a question of your own, I thought we were losing control, and so I hit you. Jesus of Nazareth, every one of my superiors has always said this about you. I need to hate you, so I hit you. And all of those answers to Jesus' question, why did you strike me, would have been explanations, but not excuses, that's for sure. They may have been truthful, but they certainly would have exposed a wickedness on the part of that man. You see, that man, that night, back then, had no good answer to Jesus' question. Why did you strike me? And neither does this man on this night, and neither do you. Tonight, I think, is a night for us all to think about what we would answer Jesus to his question, why did you strike me? If he speaks the truth, why do we strike him? Does not Jesus speak the truth when he says, do not worry? Do not worry about your life. Who of us by worrying has added even an hour to their life? And if that's the truth, why do we slap him in the face by doing more worrying than praying? In fact, worrying so much that our worry turns into a prayer, a prayer to a God who cannot hear us and cannot do anything for us. Jesus speaks the truth when he says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. He speaks the truth when he says, do not swear for any reason. But let your yes be yes and your no, no. 
Jesus speaks the truth when he says, uh, whoever looks at a woman or a man lustfully has already committed adultery in their heart. And if he speaks the truth, why do we strike him? By making people who just disagree with us our enemies and deleting them from our prayers. by punctuating our language with all kinds of curse and swear words to give them power, we think, but really it's just to vent our anger. By defining adultery in our own mind with this disclaimer, it doesn't hurt to look. Why do you strike me? That question is still hanging out there and there is no good answer to Jesus. And when you can't give a good answer to Jesus, it's hard to even look him in the eye. And so our eyes fall to the floor and then our knees hit the floor and then we just pour out our heart, confessing all of the times that we met his truth speaking into our life with our own slaps in the face and all of the times that we we resented his control in our life so much as if giving control to Jesus in our life is a bad thing why did you strike me Perhaps the only way that we can answer that question is to tearfully ask a question of our own. Jesus, why did you take it? Why indeed? For the all-powerful Son of God, the one who just moments earlier had shown those officials and that whole detachment of soldiers that he could just put them on their back whenever he wanted. For that God-man, Jesus Christ, to willingly suffer for a room full, no, a, a world full of sinners... Well, it's a, it, it, it is a conduct that just surpasses every ounce of understanding that we have. And so we ask, why? Why did you do it? And Jesus says, why did I take it? Because that's what it took. That's what it took to take away every one of your slaps against me. That's what it took to take away every affront, every offense to the holy God. Why did I take it? Because that is my mission, Jesus says to us. To make you right with a holy God. And that is a mission that I would never be deterred from by some cowardly bully or a detachment of soldiers or a whole world full of sinners or the forces of hell. I would not be deterred from my mission to save you. It's a mission that meant taking the way of the cross that I did not deserve, Jesus says, and lost my life on the cross in a way that I did not deserve. It's a mission that meant taking every one of your sins and my sins upon himself. 
because he loves us. And at the end of the day, there is no more glorious, no more accurate answer to our question, Jesus, why did you take it than this? Because I love you. And there's something else here tonight. When you know and feel and take to heart that kind of love, I mean, that kind of forgiving love, doesn't it just give you a strength? And I mean the strength that we need to do something that is very rare in this world. To speak the truth and not toxicity to speak the truth when we are sinned against. To speak the truth when we are hurt. To provide light in the darkness instead of just blowing heat. To never compromise on God's truth while never compromising on God's love. To forgive because we have been forgiven by a Savior who followed, why do you strike me with Father, forgive them. The scripture says, he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, yes, that wound on his mouth that night, we are healed. Amen. Pain and suffering, O oh Lord, bring help and healing. For people who are confused and wandering, O oh Lord, bring purpose and peace. For a world that is torn up by war and hatred, O oh Lord, shine the light of your love and understanding and protect, we pray. For us, your sheep who often wander, bring us back home, O Lord, with your firm but gentle hand. Lead us to the cross and empty tomb to find your peace and feel your power. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
the almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless us and keep us. God be with you, everybody, as you finish out your week pondering what your Savior has done for you. Truly, we can go to bed tonight at peace, wake up in the morning at peace, knowing that he has made peace between us and God. Next Wednesday, we'll have another one of our Lenten dinners and, uh, and our worship at 6.30. I want to thank uh, the growth group that was, were our hosts for dinner tonight. It was a uh, delicious dinner, and uh, I tried to refrain from eating too much <laughs> since, since I, yes, okay. And um, what else can we, oh, Sunday, coming up Sunday, we have, uh, well, first of all, Saturday night, worship at 5. Sunday at 8 and 10.30, the Feast of St. Patrick. And in between, there is Bible study for every age, including adults where we are studying in the multipurpose room, the last book of the Bible, Revelation, Making Sense of the Mystery. And we've been going at it since early September, and we're already in chapter 13 <laughs> of 22 chapters. <laughs> God be with you, everybody.